Well, um, yeah, welcome everybody to the round two of our CMFI MassBack seminar. It's been a while. Um, I hope you all had a good summer break and kind of like made it back well into like the winter semester. And we're frankly quite uh, advanced in it already. But yeah, nevertheless, it's uh, I'm pretty happy that we resumed uh, this uh, online seminar series. Um, as I wrote in the email this time, we will move a little bit um, beyond metabolites and, and focus now a little bit on larger molecules. So at least for the next um, couple of lectures, we could convince uh, some, uh, I guess, pioneers in the field to, to give guest lectures and, and provide some basics on, on protein mass spectrometry. And then, yeah, at the end, we're probably going to move a little bit to functional um, analysis. And then, yeah, it's kind of like free or undecided yet where, where the journey goes. So here it's really, I guess, uh, um, your input that, that would matter. You know, if you want to present something or if you want to like learn about some particular things, please uh, let us know. We can also discuss at the end and, you know, steer the seminar to uh, wherever it's, it's most useful um, to all of us. But yeah, to those of you who are um, new to it, uh, just some some very basic um, background. So yeah, this is a free online seminar for the community from the community. Um, it's uh, every other Tuesday uh, on Zoom. We will record it, so it will probably end up on YouTube. So I don't know, maybe people will rather watch it later. Um, with all calm uh, online on YouTube instead of like joining for the meeting. It's of course nicer to have uh, people here and, and have this interactive. So yeah, again, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself anytime and ask questions or comments. Maybe somebody says something wrong and then you can correct this. And if you also wanna like um, turn on your camera, it's nice because I have it set up so you, so you can see you. Um, all. Yeah, here's the, um, again, Zoom link. This will be a static link that's every two, at our Tuesday is going to be the same, um, but I will also email this around like the day before. So if you have not signed up to our mailing list, there's this uh, URL at the, at the bottom, you can, you can sign up. And then there's this URL at the top. If you want to like get some more um, infos, including the program of the, the seminar. So yeah, I guess so far quite some people signed up, which is um, awesome, and I, I love you um, looking at the stats to, to see what the what the background um, of all of you are. And um, I guess we have a nice mixture of like intermediate, advanced people, some um, yeah, like people who are quite new, and then also some expert users, and also like on the career level side, I think it's a it's a nice mixture. On the interest on on topics, uh, yeah, it's been interesting to track this, but yeah, like I guess main interests are like metabolomics, natural product research, but there's also like a good portion coming from like protein analysis and proteomics, which I think particularly now in, in this new round, is going to be uh, a bit more in the um, focus. So yeah, I mentioned it, uh, we will record this and then we put it in our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, we will just keep adding on um, videos in there. So if you want to watch them later, um, that's an option. Also, there's another um, playlist from our summer school we had this summer. So in case you want to learn about some particular software tools that we presented there more in detail. So there we took really like an entire week and uh, walked people through that. That's also all online. So um, check it out um, if that's um, of interest for you. But yeah, now coming to, to the topic. So yeah, thinking about like cellular complexity, um, I guess like last round we talked a lot about small molecules and obviously they're, they're kind of like really important in, in driving like biology, but there's of course so many more molecules in the cell and particular the proteins. So now when we look at like um, not a single cell, but like multiple cells or like microbial communities, so very complex systems. Of course, the amount of proteins or the amount of small molecules and the different ones becomes like way more complex, right? So now looking at like this, this meta metabolome or meta proteome, of course, we have like a huge number of, of compounds and, and proteins in there. And when we think about possible interactions, I think it's, it's really mind blowing how many things theoretically could be going on there. 
and technologies to to systematically map those interactions I think are kind of like still um, in development, but you know, becoming like more effective. And yeah, we can get inventories of, of thousands of metabolites or thousands of proteins. So that's not a question anymore. But yeah, like scaling this and, and, and thinking about like combinatorial problems there, I think is is really exciting when you think about, yeah, all the things that that can happen. And yeah, so hence it's it's quite um interesting for us from a research perspective, but also from the seminar perspective to move on from small molecules to protein mass spectrometry now. And yeah, just uh, to give you like a, a little overview of, of what you what you can do, and, and we will get into detail in, in, in these different technologies over the course of the, of the seminar. So yeah, quantitative proteomics and uh, shotgun proteomics has been like relatively well established. So for many different organisms or even environmental samples, you can get like this huge inventories of proteins and then compare different cell states, like healthy or, or disease or like different environmental conditions and then figure out what proteins are like abundant um, or like less abundant, right? Then um, there's been a lot of tools developed in the proteomics fields to um, uh, yeah, target uh, or like to identify specific um, targets, maybe through like uh, chemical probes so in chemical proteomics or also through other like biophysical principles, like this thermal proteome profiling, which uh, we're quite interested now um, in the lab. And then, yeah, last but not least, I think um, there's many protein mass spectrometry tools that allow you to like analyze like proteins as a as an intact thing. So either by like uh, denaturing top-down mass spectrometry or also by native mass spectrometry where we conserve uh, non-covalent um, interactions, for example, like in protein complexes, but also like protein ligand um, interactions. So like also here, I think our, our lab is, is quite interested in, in those things. And then, yeah, like the, the last stage is also like um, actual folding, right? So like you can get actually structural information out of mass spectrometry um, experiment when you do like cross-linking. And I think this is a other very interesting um, yeah, field where I think a lot of um, tech development has happened over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, what what is the basis of all of this? And now, yeah, we're basically doing like a little recap of, of last course, which some some of you may remember that, but yeah, like all these technologies is, is driven by, by mass spectrometry. And again, uh, I think I said that uh, at the beginning of the last round, um, it's really important to keep in mind that contemporary mass spectrometry um, is displaying masses um, of charged ions, right? So like we have M over Z. This is super um, fundamental. And I think probably the only complicated thing about mass spectrometry because the rest is rather simple because we uh, just weight molecules. Um, so that's why I like it so much because it's so intuitive. All right. So yeah, we can measure the masses uh, pretty precisely, so precisely that we can like calculate molecular formulas or we can fragment molecules and then um, yeah, like basically reconstitute their structures by, by their fragments. However, like before we can analyze those, um, yeah, we, we need to ionize them as we need um, ions. So this is uh, one of like the figures uh, I really like because it gives you like a, an overview of chemical space, basically, where we plotted here molecular weight against like polarity. Um, and then, yeah, there's different ionization methods that kind of like accommodate different polarities and different like mass ranges. So now uh, you may remember that there's like this electrospray, then there's uh, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization and an electron impact. So fortunately now um, for like proteins, as we're like at the really top um, of like this graph kind of you can uh, cross out like APCI, APPI, and EI, and we're only going to look at ESI. And technically, uh, MALDI we could use too, but I think uh, over the course, uh, what we will focus uh, mostly on is uh, electrospray ionization. And also here, just a, a recap, what we basically do is we have like this like needle that infuses like a liquid with the sample inside, and then there is a potential between like this needle tip and the inlet of the mass spec. And then we also have like a trying gas like flowing around that needle, um, basically making very small droplets. And in, in this electric field, um, they're kind of like drawn like uh, towards like the opposite uh, charge here. And as they shrink down while basically evaporating, we have like this ESI effect 
where yeah like the charged molecules come closer to each other as like the droplet shrinks and then there's basically two current models either they um, expel and like kind of like explode like this tiny droplets or the ions evaporate out of um, the droplets most important thing at the end we have yeah like single um, ions and then they get sucked in by the um, electric field into the, the mass pack where we can then analyze them and yeah here like one very important thing that uh, I think we showed last time but I want to also like reiterate for like a little bit about it is to think actually about the chemistry of like those molecules right so particularly in ESI depending on uh, what polarity you use there's different like um, yeah, like structural groups that are like more accessible to this ionization effect right so particularly when we have um, a positive mode we want to protonate molecules so here the pka value is very important right so we probably want to look at rather basic um, uh, molecules whereas the negative mode we would rather want to like look at acidic uh, molecules and yeah like two um, functional groups that are like uh, very clear so if you have like a carboxylic acid here on the very left you know that's probably a molecule that is very well to to um, analyze in negative mode whereas if you have here uh, an amine you know that is a, a base so this is like easier to protonate than to deprotonate so then that is a compound you probably should analyze rather in positive mode so now yeah there's of course all sorts of stuff in between you know and maybe sometimes it flies in both or sometimes it doesn't and um, it's complicated fortunately um, the chemical space of peptides and proteins is a little bit more limited so here yeah like we only have like the canonical amino acids that basically build up um, our proteins well sometimes some some modified ones but mainly it's it's these like, site groups that we deal with so it's kind of like easy to to take a look at and then also um, with like the current like technology it's typically um, positive mode and like the basic amino acids that that kind of like drive most our interest also due to the fact that like some proteases like cleave um, after basic amino acids so it's kind of like all tailored um, towards positive mode however I would encourage you to to actually take like a very detailed um, look at those in case you do not know the amino acids yet because I think yeah, here yeah like being aware of the chemistry is really important to like understand some of like the downstream um, implications of like different proteomic uh, tools whether it's fragmentation or ionization or actual chemical reactivity for particular label um, for particular labeling um, reactions that are quite common for example like in multiplexed um, metabol uh, proteomics experiments so and yeah here um, on the bottom left I, I plotted uh, the proton affinity from some of these side chains and as I mentioned um, yeah like how uh, yeah well these side chains um, attract like protons is also important for um, yeah like the, the actual fragmentation so here there's a thing called um, like mobile proton model where you basically assume that like the proton when you have here protonation at like the um, amino group at the n-terminus or here at like a basic site group you know also moves over like the backbone of the um, of like this peptide uh, chain right and now depending on like the um, yeah like uh, affinity of like the different like um, amino acids you know there's a certain likeliness that the proton will residue um, at uh, uh, a certain like position and then yeah based on that there is um, this very frequently observed um, fragmentation into like B and Y ions right during collision induced dissociation and that is related basically to like the movement of like the protons along like this chain and yeah for basically every CID uh, or HCD based fragmentation experiment which is probably 95 percent of proteomics experiments you know this is this is really um important so yeah here the chemistry really comes to play so please take take a look if, if you want okay then uh we had uh here our pokemon deck right and like the different cards uh um, the different mass specs have certain um capabilities which we i think introduced in detail 
um, during the last round. I just want to reiterate on one here, and, and that is resolution, because I think this is particularly important for like the data analysis later. Obviously, things such as like scan speed um, and sensitivity are like very important, and last but not least, the cost too. But I think like for for this course right now, we want to mainly focus on um, the difference in, in resolution. And just to give you an idea, if you measure mass, you know, you get like this Gaussian distribution here over like the MZ range and then the difference between like a quadrupole, which we typically use for like isolating um, the ions for a father MS-MS experiment is quite different than the high resolution here of like an FTICR experiment or an Orbitrap or a high resolution TOF. All right, so I think this is something to, to keep in mind, this is particularly important because you, you get certain isotope resolutions or not isotope resolutions, depending on the mass analyzer you use. So yeah, just um, so you, you kind of like know uh, what, what is the limiting factor there. All right. Okay, so just to do a very brief recap on um, the analyzers. So I mentioned it already, like a quadrupole is like more on like on the low resolution side. So here we typically get, I don't know, 0.1 m over z uh, mass accuracy. So that's kind of like the the steps uh, we would we would scan. Um, and yeah, we typically say unit resolution also. Um, however, this is this is, doesn't uh, need to be a bad thing, right? Particularly because they are very cheap, they're very effective, um, and we can use them nicely as filters. So yeah, how how does that work? Um, yeah, we have like this four rods and uh, we have like uh, like polarity switching basically between like those those rods at a given frequency. And now, you know, you have to like think about like that ion basically flying through like those rods in like a spiral type of, of trajectory and now always towards the opposite um, charged rods. So right now, if that would be positive mode and here our ion is like positively charged in the middle, you know, it would fly um, towards like the negatively charged rod. So now this polarity changes with a certain frequency. So then it kind of does not make it. So it tries to like now go um, towards the next rod. And then, you know, this moves on. And ideally, if the frequency is right, you know, it will never reach like one of the rods. If the frequency is not right for, for the mass of this ion, you know, it will just get like um, discharged by, by basically colliding uh, onto like the quadrupole. Um, and yeah, that way, by, by setting this to like a certain um, frequency, we can kind of like use this as a mass filter. And this is really important in the context of like, yeah, hybrid mass specs, such as like here, this QTOF, where we first isolate a certain ion package before we then, you know, um, fragment it in a, in a collision cell and then get a second MS spectrum from like this high resolution TOF analyzer. And yeah, like you really have to think about it in a, in a most simple way. You take like all ions, push them with the same kinetic energy, and then measure the flight time they need to like pass through this field-free um, flight tube. Okay, and then yeah, we, this is mass dependent. So we would basically plot this flight time against um, yeah, like the number of ions that, that collide to the detector at a given time point, and then was like calibrating the um, yeah, like uh, TOF analyzer with like known molecules, you know, we can assign certain flight times to masses. And then you get here this mass spectrum. So now, as I mentioned in, in a hybrid experiment, you know, for MSMS, -MS, we can first isolate a certain like mass here with like the quadrupole, in this case, like the screen ion, and then fragment it in the collision uh, cell. And then, yeah, like submit these fragments to the TOF experiment. And then this would be, the MSMF thing. I assume this is old news for, for many of you. Um, if, in case it wasn't, I hope this is this is clear now because yeah, like tandem mass spectrometry, I think in most um, M, uh, proteomics experiments is, is kind of like the fundamental thing to do. So you will hear perhaps a lot about MSMS um, and other like fragmentation experiments in the course um, of the seminar. All right, then yeah, there is other mass spec platforms such as like Orbitraps that kind of like do like the same thing, just they have a different like physical principle in like generating this, this MS spectra. So here, instead of like um, accelerating ions and let them fly through like um, 
uh, a field free drift tube. Uh, we would like let ions like basically orbit like the central electrode here inside of the orbit trap. And now, yeah, by basically measuring the frequency of like this up and down movement of like the ion packages, we can derive the mass very precisely. Um, yeah, as this is like recorded as a frequency, we need like a Fourier transformation step in order to convert this to, to mass spectra. But yeah, like the machine does that pretty painlessly on the fly. And what you typically get is like some nice, uh, not too noisy uh, mass spectra. So now this is uh, typically coupled with chromatography. Also here, I think we gave a more detailed introduction last time, but just again, in a nutshell, we have kind of like this column chromatography, typically um, HPLC or nano um, LC, where we have like a hydrophobic stationary phase, typically C18. And then like, yeah, basically our analytes are like pumped through like this, this column. And then depending on like the, um, like their uh, yeah, polarity bind more or less good to like the stationary phase. And then we get like this chromatographic separation. So now, yeah, how does that look? Um, yeah, we first have this dimension of like chromatography. Um, then, yeah, we can like get like full scan experiments or MSMS experiments in the whatever Orbitrap in this case or top analyzer. And then we get like, um, yeah, like MS1 spectra and MS2 spectra. And how does that typically look? So this here would be, um, yeah, a TIC. So this is a to total ion chromatogram from one of like the, um, yeah, shotgun proteomics runs we, we did in the lab and you see, yeah, there's a ton of like different peaks coming down and yeah, like uh, many different uh, peptides. So now, yeah, this are peptides, uh, even though at the beginning this were proteins. So why peptides and not proteins in case you're, you're not um, aware of this, most proteomics experiments actually analyze at the end peptides. So we take like intact proteins and chop them into like small pieces, typically with uh, trypsin that uh, again, um, yeah, if you know the chemistry, cleave typically after the basic amino acids. So this would be um, typically arginine and um, lysine. And then, yeah, we get like this nice, small, handy pieces of peptides. So why are we doing this? Why are we making like a complex sample even more complex by chopping them in, in small pieces? Um, often intact proteins are not so easy to analyze, right? So like making them into like, yeah, just the right size uh, of peptides makes the, that process much more like efficient. And yeah, like they have like better like analytical accessibility in contemporary um, LCMS MS setups. Um, so yeah, this is, probably also 90% plus of like proteomics experiment um, what, they're, what they're doing. So now, of course, instead of like chopping them into small pieces, we theoretically also can um, build up their identities by fragments, right? So instead of like, yeah, like now uh, building it up from peptides, we can like go at like the full um, protein at once and like directly ionize an intact protein and then fragment it the same way um, with like uh, some collision induced dissociation or electron based methods and get basically fragments to, to reconstitute the sequence. And yeah, this is called top down proteomics. And that's a particular interest um, of mine and yeah, we're, still, we're still using it mainly in the context of uh, snake venoms, which uh, fortunately are like not too big proteins, so they're nicely accessible and like also very um, uh, hydrophilic. So they're, they're like very good to like separate on um, reverse phase HPLC systems. And then yeah, here for like a three finger toxin from like the spitting cobra here, we would get like this nice fragmentation series where we can like clearly identify like the proteins and assign PTMs um, and so on. But yeah, all more to this uh, later in the course of the of the seminar. Anyway, so now, yeah, I think for the remaining uh, remaining time of the um, today's seminar, I just want to like showcase actually some, yeah, like real spectra. So I just like copied that from, from uh, the mass spec uh, just before the, the seminar. And I just wanted to show you how like um, uh, small peptides, so like triplic peptides 
um, actually look. So this here would be um, just a random scan from like a, a shotgun proteomics run where we look at like the MS1 level, okay? So now, um, okay, just wanna do like the most simple uh, thing now. So what would be the mass of uh, these different species uh, we're, we're looking at? Somebody wants to unmute himself and, and just throw the answer in. Somebody volunteering? If not, I'm gonna ask Paolo to answer. <laughs> oh, Federico. <laughs> okay, it's, it's actually pretty pretty simple, right? Okay, well, simple, but maybe not simple. So I would say I don't really know, right? Because um, again, we have M over Z here, right? And unless you know the Z, you do not really know what the mass is. I mean, you could say now here, okay, that biggest peak is 978. And in the metabolomics experiment, everybody would have said, oh yeah, like this has the mass 978, maybe it's protonated, so then it's 977. But like in, yeah, like dealing with like peptides or especially proteins that does not work anymore, right? Because maybe it's single charge, maybe it's double charge, maybe triple, quadruple, or so on. So who of you can tell me what how many charges this has? Perhaps two. Um, you're right. How did you know that? Uh, usually, um... What I see is uh, I have a, a bit experience with the peptide uh, chromatogram and 1954 seems like a molecular ion and that will be like the doubly charged uh, uh, ion of this 1954. That's mm -hmm. why I predicted. Nice. Yeah, that is a good observation. So you did already some sort of um, charge distribution deconvolution. Great. Um, another rational why that could be probably doubly charged is because I said this was a shotgun proteomics experiment, so we have trypsin as a protease, so we typically cleave after lysine and arginine, that plus the N-terminus makes it normally, most of the time, two basic uh, residues in our peptide, so double charges are like very frequent, right? But, I mean, unless you would have I mean, this is a great, great job spotting that 1954. Um, but yeah, unless you see the isotope pattern, typically you would have not known, right? This could also be triply charged. So my base assumption was like the two um, basic groups might be right, but maybe not if there's like a cliff, uh, a missed cleavage site or something, right? So a much better way to actually determine this is to look at the data in detail. So obviously you could not do that because I did not zoom in enough. But if I would show you now that zoom version here of that same peak, and in addition to like the monoisotopic or like the average most abundant uh, peak, you would also see now nicely the 13C isotope peaks. You know, you could straight say, okay, that is the charge. So now, how do you do that? You can see the differences in between the different peaks. And if you think that it's 13C instead of 12C, you would have a difference of one, but we have a difference of half a MZ. So we have a doubly charge. So we get our one to 0 0.5. Exactly. Uh, that's super straightforward, right? And I mean, here we see very nicely, the Delta is always 0 0.5 um, MZ. So yeah, this is likely um, doubly charged, uh, but we knew that already due to like Keshop's uh, sharp analysis here. So thanks again. Um, but yeah, like, okay, this was an easy case. So now what about this one here? So this is actually um, some inter protein mass spectra from uh, a native experiment uh, we did. And uh, yeah, we have now this bigger peaks and you see they're also already like pretty wide and it's kind of like a little bit more complicated. So now again, you could do the charge um, distribution deconvolution, but maybe, and here the resolution of our instrument plays in, when we zoom in, again, we will get this isotope 
uh, resolution, which by the way is very nice. Um, and then, you know, we can calculate again, like the deltas. So what would be the charge of this um, protein here? You just need to like follow uh, Stelio's explanation. <laughs> so it would be one divided by 0 0.1 and that is 10, right? Okay, so relatively straightforward. Um, now, if we get more charges, obviously that um, difference becomes smaller. If we get many charges, that difference becomes so small that we can actually not resolve that anymore, depending on the resolution um, of our machine, right? So here I picked an example where that would be the case. So we would not have um, the isotope resolution anymore. But now uh, we can do what, what Keshap did. Uh, we can actually look at like the, the distribution of the pattern, right? And now there's this like very nice assumption. We can just like look at one pair that we think is in sequence of the um, numbers of like protons. So yeah, basically uh, the two pairs, one should have one charge state more, right? One proton more. And then we could call them uh, M1 and M2. And then yeah, basically by using this equation here, we can simply look at the ratio and then, um, yeah, like calculate the charge state there and then can kind of like uh, multiply it by uh, the Z and then get the um, exit mass. And yeah, here this would be like kind of like an ideal um, like distribution where we observe from uh, Z equals one kind of like all the way to like uh, Z 11 or so here at the um, at the bottom. But yeah, I think this is uh, uh, one of like the main take home messages for today. So um, again, yeah, we have like this uh, charge clusters that I just showed you and we can use that for like the deconvolution. Um, so this is basically like this nice distribution of charge stages. And then if we have high enough resolution, you know, and we can get the isotopes resolved, we can most simply um, use the um, yeah, like difference between the different isotope peaks and, and calculate the charge from that. If you would do an MS-MS experiment, this is how you would um, basically get um, the different charge stages there. And, and this is quite um, essential for like modern top-down experiments. Um, for native mass spectrometry, where we deal with like super, um, yeah, like massively charged uh, proteins or protein complexes, obviously we do not get that resolution anymore. So here, this charge state um, or charge distribution deconvolution becomes very important. And yeah, fortunately, there will be one of the experts giving actually um, a lecture down the line on the tool they developed. Um, so um, hopefully we will all at the end uh, become experts on that. But yeah, so I hope this uh, uh, was a good introduction to yeah, like protein mass spectrometry. And uh, um, hopefully you're kind of like eager to explore a little bit more like the cellular content and in terms of like proteins. And I think there is a wonderful amount of different tools to go in detail and, and figure out what the different, you know, like abundances and PTMs and interactions uh, within cellular environments are. Um, yeah, we have a, a couple of uh, uh, lectures planned. So like next time, Florian Meyer will start with, uh, yeah, like a more detailed uh, introduction to bottom-up proteomics and different data acquisition methods, including PASEF and per perhaps like um, some of their like new uh, PASEF synchro methods, which I'm super eager to hear about. And then, yeah, like down the line, we will move on to like top-down and native mass spectrometry. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, again, from last round, um, in case you want to get some more recaps of, of what we um, talked about there, everything is on YouTube. So here, if you go to that program list and scroll down, you can see the links to the to the old talks. So yeah, please feel free to um, uh, to check it out if you want. And then yeah, I think for the for the rest of today's meeting, we can uh, open this up for for discussion uh, and you know have some questions and answers or feedback on. Um, very much looking forward to that. So again, thanks uh, for joining so far and hope to see you uh, all in two weeks.